Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Julianne Worden, and I'll be your host this evening as we travel along with our guests, Yena Clausen and Dave Herline. Yena and Dave are married, and they are the original guides for our Scandinavia tour, so I'm excited to explore Denmark with them and all of you tonight. And now without further ado, I have the pleasure of introducing Yena and Dave, who will be our guests this evening. Hi, Yena. Hi, Dave. Hi. Welcome, welcome to our home. Yes. Well, thank you for joining us. I'm very excited to have you here. And I don't know about you, but I have a, a beer ready to go here. A Danish oh, we beer. just happen to have one here as oh. well. Oh, well. <laughs> this glass just came out of the freezer. It was all frosty, but it's warmed up already. Great. Well, later in the show, if you have a drink at home, we will be doing a special Danish cheers or skull, they call it. And so save a little bit of your drink for later in the show. So um, to begin, both Dave and Yena have so much history with Rick Steves Europe, the company. So Yena, why don't we begin with you? You are Danish. How yeah. did you, um, how are you connected with Rick Steves Europe and what do you do now? Uh, well, I worked for Rick Steves in the office uh, and also worked as a tour guide for a number of years. Um, and then currently I'm working uh, for a marketing agency in the field of cloud technology. In my spare time, I am just uh, delighted to be associated with the National Nordic Museum as a member of the Board of Trustees. And we actually have a picture here of the new National Nordic Museum. It's recently moved into a stunning new building. And uh, this uh, atrium that we're looking at is actually a symbolic fjord uh, crossed by bridges. And the permanent exhibit uh, focuses on the uh, Scandinavian immigrant uh, experience. And there are special exhibits on key Scandinavia art genres and breathtaking amount of programs and events every day and every week. And I would encourage anybody who is listening in to visit the National Nordic Museum in Seattle um, if you ever have a chance to come to Seattle. Yeah, wow, I did not know that what represented Fjord. I, yeah, if you're in Seattle, I recommend going. I've never been, but it looks like an exceptional museum and it's special to have in our city. And Dave, let's see, how did you and Yena meet and when did you start working with Rick? Back in the early 80s, I graduated in architecture and I took a class Rick had about traveling in Europe before I took my first big trip in 82. And I loved Denmark on that trip. I just uh, love the people. I love the sense of design. I love their lively pedestrian streets and squares. So I decided I would study urban design. Now there's a school in Copenhagen at the Royal Academy that does that, but it's in Danish. And so I figured, well, I better learn Danish. Luckily, Seattle has a lot of the Scandinavian community. And so Yena was over for a year teaching Danish. So we met that way. She was my Danish teacher and the rest is uh, history. And at that class um, of Rick, that Rick Steves um, gave me when I was you know, taking my first trip to Europe, I noticed that his class was great, but his maps could use some work. He was doing it himself, like he was doing everything himself in those days with a ballpoint pen. And so after class one day, I went up to him and I said, I love your class, Rick, but your maps could use some help. <laughs> and that's how I got my proverbial foot in the door. Yeah, wow. Well, I love that you two have been working with Rick in some capacity for so long. And Yena, you even have a special connection with the Scandinavia tours. Is it true that you kind of helped start that, this tour? Yes, it is. We actually, um, we, Dave and I did the first tour as kind of a test balloon just to try it out. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I suggested to Rick that we try to turn it into an actual program. Um, Rick wasn't that excited initially, but I convinced him that uh, what we could do to kind of promote the idea of public transportation is that we would conduct part of the tour using buses and trains and boats. Uh, so that's what we did. We designed the tour around those elements and there was a fantastic experience. Wow. And on the tour um, in the early days, we even, they visited Yena's family farm on the tour. So we'll get to see that later in the show. So that will be special to see. And I just feel lucky to have such great guests with us this evening to explore Denmark with us. So let's get started. And um, Rick, we'll start with taking us around Denmark. Uh, 
Does Jackson like shrimp? He does. Whoa! whoa, whoa. <laughs> I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we're down on the beach, got a good cold beer, and the shrimp's on the barbie. It must be the best of Denmark. Thanks for joining us. He liked that. Denmark is small, flat, and really well organized. While the capital city, Copenhagen, is a thriving metropolis and the country does have a vigorous economy, get out into the countryside and what the traveler finds is closer to cute. We'll imagine sailing with the Vikings. Marvel at the ultimate Lego creations. Visit with one really old bog man and then one really big boy. Drop in on a royal palace, picnic on a Danish beach, and explore a remote island by bike. And it's all linked by an awe-inspiring network of roads and bridges. In the north of Europe, Denmark anchors Scandinavia to the continent. It's made mostly of Jutland, which juts up from Germany, and two major islands. Just outside of Copenhagen, we'll tour Frederiksborg Castle, then we'll visit Roskilde, Odense, Aarhus, and the Isle of Aero. So Dave, did you make this map since you do maps for Rick Steves Europe? I did make that map. And that's an example, of, obviously, of a simple map. Uh, maps for TV, in the case of this show, for example, Rick is only doing the voiceover about the geography for five or 10 seconds. So the map has to be really simple and then really clear. And in fact, uh, travel maps in general tend to be that way. They're uh, designed to show relationships between places and, and kind of teach people about, about a country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this map, this is of larger Scandinavia. You did this one as well? Exactly. Um, back in the old days, they were all done hand-drawn with, with pen and ink and then colored in later. And this one shows Denmark's size, fairly small in relation to the rest of Scandinavia. But the nice thing about a hand-drawn map is it uh, has kind of a nice sense of, uh, of personality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll learn later, even though Denmark is quite small, it was very powerful in its uh, heyday. So that'll be neat to learn more about that later. Small but mighty. Yeah. <laughs> and then speaking of small, here's another map. This is an example of our digitized maps that we've been doing lately. We get a lot more um, detail and accuracy, maybe at the loss of a little bit of personality, but it shows what Rick was talking about, that Jutland sticks up from the, the northern part of Germany, and there's two main islands, Funen in, in the center, and then Zealand over to the right. Those are connected um, to each other and to the mainland of Sweden by beautiful bridges we'll talk about later as well. As far as the size of Denmark, to give you a sense, uh, if you can see where Copenhagen is over on the right, if you were to get in a car and drive to the very tip of Jutland up to a place called Skaen, that would take you about four or five hours just to get a sense of Denmark's size. Wow, wow, not too bad, really. <laughs> and Jaina, where is your family farm located or where are you from in Denmark? Uh, so uh, if you take a look at that word, Frederiksborg, if you could just circle that, Julianne, um, where you see the D in that uh, word, like Fred, uh, right there uh, where the D is, is where my farm is located. Uh, it's about um, 60 miles Northwest of Copenhagen. It's very close to um, to the sea, rolling hills. It's it's just a beautiful place. Wow! And we even have a picture of you at your farm. Yeah. So uh, this is me and my horse Bonanza, and mm -hmm. I also ha happen to have a a, a dog called Lassie. And people always thought it was very interesting that I had a, a dog named Lassie and a, and a horse named Bonanza. I don't think that anybody knew that there was anything funny about that <laughs> until I was told upon my arrival uh, on the American shore. Yes. Well, was Lassie just a coincidence or did you know the show? Um, you know, I, I think I did know the show and it was a collie. It was a border collie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I love horses and it's just a special thing, I think, to visit a farm. So people must have loved that back then yeah. in the tours. And we are headed from a farm to a castle. Next, we are headed to Fredericksburg Castle.
Well, just a small country today of roughly 5 million people. In the 16th century, the Danish Empire included all of Scandinavia and even stretched into Germany. It had a fearsome military and demanded respect from its neighbors. And in a small town north of Copenhagen, as if floating on a lake, is a reminder of all that power, the stunning Frederiksborg Castle. Many consider this the grandest castle in Scandinavia, the Danish Versailles. Built in the early 1600s, Frederiksborg is the castle of Denmark's greatest king, Christian IV. This was one of the king's favorite residences with a suitably regal entry ringed by a moat designed more for swans than defense. The king imported Dutch Renaissance architects to create his own Christian IV style, which, by the way, you see in fancy buildings all over Copenhagen. The royal apartments exude royal opulence. For over a century, the palace has been a museum, offering a stroll through the story of Denmark from 1500 until today. It serves as Denmark's national portrait gallery. In the audience room, the king would receive important visitors. Paintings of Denmark's military victories over neighboring Sweden line the walls, reminding visiting VIPs of Denmark's power. And the Great Hall was known as the Dancing Hall in Christian IV's day. With the orchestra playing from their perch above, this is where he'd throw his lavish parties. Gazing out the windows, guests would marvel at the king's Baroque garden. Sculpted royal gardens, like the palaces, were used as propaganda. The king rules everything in his realm, even nature. I loved that scene because you could see how luxurious this castle is. So you can see the power of Denmark. But it also, just this line Rick just said, the king rules everything in his realm, even nature. This reminded me of Louis XIV in France. I believe he said something similar when he built Versailles. And, you know, I'm kind of curious, what is the current status of the Danish monarchy? Um, it is a fairly low key monarchy. Uh, we have a queen currently, her name is uh, Margrethe. And um, I think Danes in general are very positive about uh, the monarchy. Um, it's a very, it's not ostentatious at all. I think they take pride in being part of the people and not necessarily being displaying wealth because that's not a popular thing to do in Denmark. Um, Margrethe is very well liked. She's multi-talented uh, in terms of being an artist. And um, she has a son, Crown Prince uh, Frederick, and uh, he and his wife, Mary, uh, have um, four children. Wow. Wow, that's pretty neat. And, uh, and you, Australian, you said, is the... Australian, yes. Wow. Uh, I believe they met during the Sydney Olympics. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's cool. And then we have a little additional the yelling stones is how is that how you pronounce these yeah we call it uh yelling yelling the yelling stones and essentially the the stones uh, the large stone is what we call the birth certificate of denmark it was actually erected by harold bluetooth and he was a viking king and at about 985 um he was um a little bit concerned about the bishops of Germany wanting to Christianize Denmark. So he erected this stone and said that he had Christianized the Danes because that would prevent the Germans from claiming that he was a heathen. Wow. Whether he was indeed Christian or not remains uh, a mystery, but it is a beautiful work of art. Yes. And uh, the stones that we see in those cabinets today have no color on them, but uh, at the time it's believed that they were, were actually brightly colored. Wow, just like the old Greek statues that we see now that are just all white, they used to think those were brightly colored as well. And of course the Danish flag here. Yes. Mm -hmm. So so it's one of the oldest uh, flags in the world, it's called uh, Danibro. And it supposedly fell down from the sky, if you believe that, uh, during a crusade in uh, Estonia um, in 1219. I believe we even have a date. I can't remember the date, but the year is 1219. That's one of those things that's, that's drilled into school children, at least when I went to school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like 70, 1776 in the US. <laughs> well, let's continue on with even more Danish history. Christian IV wanted the grandest royal chapel in Europe. While it's always been a Lutheran church, 
Here the uncharacteristically ornate decor celebrates the power of the earthly king. The symbolism preaches a royal theology. God blessed the Danes with a great king who they should obey. This fine inlaid woodwork dates from 1620. Two centuries of Danish royalty were crowned in this church. Emblems celebrate subjugated realms of the Danish king. This one represents Norway, which was long a part of the Danish Empire. In King Christian's day, Europe was extremely fragmented. Today, Europe's evolving into a single free trade zone of over 400 million people. And like the United States invested in its interstate highway system to Greece commerce, Europe's investing in huge bridges and tunnels, so its cars, trucks, and bullet trains no longer need to load onto ferries, as was the time-consuming norm until just recently. The Oresund Bridge connects Denmark and Sweden. This 10-mile-long link serves both trains and cars. It consists of a tunnel beneath the sea, an artificial island, and a five-mile-long bridge. A high-tech control room oversees the flow of traffic across a border travelers hardly notice. By making the Swedish city of Malmo just a quick commute from Copenhagen, this bridge created Europe's most dynamic new metropolitan area the largest in all of Scandinavia. Wow, I feel like one thing that's often talked about is the infrastructure in Northern Europe, bridges and dikes. Have you been on this bridge, Jana, and did it have a big impact in um, Denmark and Northern Europe? Uh, yes, it was really important um, to have this new bridge because essentially it meant that you could um, transport goods all the way from the polar circle all the way down to the boot of Italy or, and down to Spain without having to stop. Well, of course you still have to stop, but uh, you don't really need to. But this bridge is, you know, so exciting to have. Uh, also for people who live in Copenhagen, some of my friends have actually lived in Malmö because it was cheaper, it was a lower cost of living than buying a house in Copenhagen. So they would just take the train from Malmö to Copenhagen. It's about a 30, 30 minute commute from Malmö Central Station to the Copenhagen Central Station. Wow. Well, that is better than my commute. So that sounds that sounds great. Just a half hour train. That's not <laughs> bad at all. <laughs> well, as Rick says in the show, we are pulling a UE. We're not going on the bridge. And we're headed to the historic town of Roskilde. While the bridge leads to Sweden, we've pulled a UE and are heading west to Roskilde, Denmark's historic capital. Denmark's roots, both Viking and royal, are on display in Roskilde. 800 years ago, this was the seat of Denmark's royalty, its center of power. Today, after fires and recent development, the town's mostly modern. The place that introduced Christianity to Denmark back in 980 is most famous today for hosting Northern Europe's biggest rock festival each July. Roskilde's centerpiece is its imposing 12th century cathedral. It's a stately old church with fine wood carvings and a great 16th century organ. Some paintings survive from before the Reformation. The cathedral is the resting place of 39 Danish kings and queens. Side chapels are filled with ornate royal tombs. After the Reformation gutted the church of its saints and Marys, more space around the high altar was freed up for more royal tombs. These date from the 16th century. The oldest tomb from 1397 is Queen Margarita I. Through strong leadership and clever negotiating, she united the three Nordic kingdoms. For 500 years, St. George has marked the hour by killing the dragon, reminding the people how the church is their bastion against the evil of the world. Wow, well, one thing I love about Northern Europe, I have not been to Denmark, but I've been to Northern Germany, is the unique art architecture that's there, often seen in churches. They use a lot of bricks in their churches and there's exposed brick. Dave, can you talk about Northern European architecture at all? Uh, sure, you definitely do see a lot of bricks up there, largely because that was the material that was available. A lot of their forests were cut down way before that. And of course they didn't have the riches of Italy, for example, that could afford to cover the churches in marble and travertine and, and all that. And you see bricks all over in Denmark in large buildings like cathedrals and also in a lot of residential architecture as well. 
One thing about Denmark I really like though is their modern architecture. Particularly there's a firm right now called the Bjarke Ingels Group and the acronym is BIG, B-I-G, and that speaks to their ideas and perhaps the ego of Bjarke <laughs> Ingels. And we'll see a couple of their buildings uh, later in the show. Okay, great. Well, yeah, I love it. I'm excited to see these more modern buildings too because they're really neat. I've seen the pictures, they're fun. And now we're going to go even farther back in history to Vikings, the Viking Age. A short walk takes us to Roskilde's waterfront. The word vike means shallow inlet. So Vikings are the people who lived along those inlets. Roskilde, strategically located along one such inlet, is home to Denmark's Viking Ship Museum. This museum is a hands-on center for people who want to experience Denmark's seafaring heritage. Traditional boat building techniques are demonstrated. And the museum's archaeological workshop employs the latest technology in conserving and better understanding remnants that survived from those fabled 10th century masters of the sea. The main hall displays five different Viking ships. These ships were deliberately sunk a thousand years ago to block the harbor entrance to the strategic and rich city of Roskilde. In 1962, they were raised from their salty grave. This was a 10th century ocean-going freighter. A ship like this likely carried Viking immigrants with their families and the entire farm to Iceland and later on to the New World. Leif Erikson made it all the way to America a thousand years ago in a little ship like this. Warships were skinnier and faster. This one was powered by 26 oarsmen. Fearsome boats like this terrorized much of Europe back when people dreaded those rampaging Norsemen. And like so many sites in Denmark, there's fun for the kids. This hands-on corner brings out the Viking in Young Danes. This to me just seems like a classic European museum because they have the exciting historical exhibits, but then they have the fun interactive section for the kids. Have you two been to this museum or maybe even been on one of the reconstructed boats? Yes, we have. Uh, it was a lot of fun to do that. We got to steer and we got to row as well. My son and I actually um, noticed that uh, last year, uh, one of the warships, we built warships called the Sea Stallion was anchored in the little town close to where my parents live. And that um, warship was actually sailed to uh, Dublin um, by its own power, by sail and by rowing in 2007. And it didn't use any modern, uh, you know, rudders or tools or anything like that. It was basically people rowing and sailing the ship. Uh, they did tell us that they, they had a radar, life jackets and satellite phones on board. That was the only thing that the Vikings didn't have. <laughs> wow, yeah, I can't believe that they made it to the United States. They made it all the way to North America. It's crazy, isn't it? With just one of those little ships and the giant ocean waves. I can't even, ugh. I'm glad they've like, they had life jackets <laughs> to get to Dublin. And well, speaking of children, next we're going to hear about one of the most beloved, I think, children's authors in um, Denmark. Heading further west, we cross another spectacular bridge, benefiting again from Denmark's investment in a series of bridges and highways that laces this nation's islands together. Somehow, Denmark, with limited natural resources and a small population base, has arranged its priorities and found the funds to build its impressive infrastructure. Odense, Denmark's third largest city with nearly 200,000 people, is big and industrial. The city, like almost every town in Denmark, has a traffic-free shopping street that gives it a strolling charm. While Odense is relatively nondescript, the reason tourists stop in is to visit the home of its famous son, Hans Christian Andersen. Today, his humble birth house stands on a cobbled lane. It's literally the corner of a museum packed with mementos from the writer's life. The exhibit entertains and inspires a steady stream of children and tourists. You'll see a display on the age in which Andersen lived, 1805 to 1875, and letters from his life and times. A library shows Andersen's books from all around the world. 
His tales were translated into nearly 150 languages. And headsets play a selection of fairy tales. Sketches from his extensive travels were souvenirs of experiences and adventures that would eventually help inspire his famous tales. Children loved the way he'd fashion a paper cutout as he told a story, revealing his creation with the finale of his tale. Young Anderson fans gathered daily through the summer in the Museum Garden's Fairy Tale Theater. Wide-eyed and enthralled, they're entertained by old H.C. himself. And a cast of characters right out of his favorite fairy tales. It all culminates, hopefully, in a happy ending. Well, I thought it interesting that Rick took a few minutes in the show to focus on Hans Christian Andersen, but I know he likes to focus on kind of smaller and almost quirkier things in different countries. Jena, could you tell us about the significance of Hans Christian Andersen to the Danish people? Yes, I, I don't think people would call him, you know, the quirkier things of Denmark. Mm -hmm. He is larger than life in Denmark. And uh, when you grow up as a child, you always hear his uh, fairy tales. They can be a little bit scary, but they actually have meanings beyond just what children uh, understand at the time. So they have extra meaning for adults as well. And it's interesting to read them to your children when uh, you are an adult. And um, in many ways, I would say, uh, and we call him Ho C. Anderson. We never say Hans Christian. Um, in many ways, he was an ugly duckling himself, uh, just to use the title from one of his most famous fairy tales. And uh, actually, he traveled far and wide in Europe uh, in the 1800. He was a very timid person, a very shy person, but he roamed around uh, Europe uh, despite of that. And he even met Charles Dickens, who supposedly said of Hans Christian Andersen, He's the most boring man I've ever met in my life. So they, uh, not so significant in, in England, yes. Wow. Well, I feel like Charles Dickens just must not have understood him to think that he's so boring. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's good to know that he's H.C. Anderson. Is yes. Call him. Mm -hmm. Yes. Jutland, that part of Denmark that juts up from Germany, is a gentle land of rolling hills, thatched villages, and bucolic farms. This is also the land of Lego. Legoland is Scandinavia's top kids' site. If you have a child, or still are one at heart, it's a fun stop. This huge park is a fanciful world created with the help of 58 million Lego bricks. They say if you stretched all these Lego blocks out, they'd reach from here all the way to Italy. In the dynamic mini world, children get their first grand tour, checking out famous Scandinavian cityscapes before traveling further afield, through Europe and on to America. For me, the highlight is simply to see Danes at play in their reserved yet fun-loving way. Each year, Legoland opens up new rides and play zones, and more Danish families make this a fun day out. Wow, the Danish Legoland just kind of seems unreal to me. When I was very young, I went to Legoland. I think it's in San Diego is the one I went to. Yeah, but, the weather's better. Yes, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but how have you been to Legoland many times over the years? Um, we have. Um, our son Nils is 17 now. He's probably, I think, two or maybe three in that picture. And he's been pretty much every year of his life. Uh, Ian actually grew up going to Legoland quite a bit because her aunt and uncle lived nearby. But for a toddler, Legoland is great. You know, there's this mini land that shows you all these beautiful buildings, re recreations in this little park. And there's some rides that are fairly tame by, say, Disneyland standards that the little ones really like. Mm -hmm. And then as kids get older, I would say this age here, about 10 or so, is kind of the prime time for in really enjoying Legoland. There's all kinds of great ice cream treats you can have. Uh, the rides are a little more exciting. And there's even a place where you can learn how to drive. You get in these little electric cars, they give you instructions. And if you complete the course, 
you get a little symbolic uh, Legoland driver's license. Well, I, I did do this at the, in the California one and I was upset. I'm the youngest out of my two, two siblings and they got to go in kind of the cooler course and I was stuck in the little tiny, like little circle. <laughs> so I was kind oh, of cold, geez. Well, <laughs> I guess you got to start somewhere. Yes. <laughs> and re recently for kids who are a little bit older, they've opened a place called Lego house. And this is a building by the architect we were talking about, Bjarke Ingels group. This is a view from the, from the air. And you can see how the building is made up of colored oversized Lego blocks. So it's very fanciful and yet a very meaningful creation. And then inside are a lot of very interesting interactive exhibits. And I've heard, I've not been to this myself, but I've heard from a coworker um, that uh, her son who is a, a teenager really, really enjoyed this. So um, if you go to Legoland, definitely go to the Lego house as well. Wow, that's much more impressive than the little square homes I would make out of Legos when yeah. I was a kid. <laughs> Let's see. Ooh, and we're moving on. We don't cover this in the show, but I know both of you were excited to talk about this. So I'm glad that we can share it uh, yeah. with the viewers. Mm -hmm. so, so this is a new uh, museum in, in Denmark on the west coast of Denmark. Um, and it is actually big or Bjarke Ingels uh, company that has developed this museum. And it's integrated into an old German uh, bunker. Um, and the entire west coast of Denmark used to be lined by bunkers as part of Hitler's uh, Atlantic Wall. Um, so, so while we see part of the museum here, uh, the rest of it is, it, uh, is actually um, nestled into the various uh, dunes. And there are all kinds of cool exhibits in there, including mining and mine sheep, uh, sweeping, how to find and locate mines. Uh, there is actually in Denmark, there's a movie called Under the Sand. Uh, it's a good movie if you want to learn more about um, Denmark after the war, uh, but uh, it's not for the faint of heart, but super interesting uh, movie uh, to watch if you have a chance. Mm -hmm. And then here is this more bunkers kind of scattered across the beaches. Yeah, so there used to be a lot of bunkers along the beaches, uh, but they have mostly been uh, removed now and only a few remain. Uh, it's largely because people were getting injured on old rebar and concrete and would jump into these bunkers and get hurt. So mm -hmm. liability issues, um, they were removed, most of them. Yes, wow. This Looking at this, it reminds me of Port Townsend in Washington, Fort Warden, if you've ever been there, but they have old abandoned military sites that you can go explore. And yeah, so this is what it reminds me of seeing this picture. And we're going from World War II history to Aarhus, if I'm pronouncing that maybe correctly, where we'll see a different period of history. Rick loves an open air folk museum. And so he explores an open air folk museum in this next clip and you can tell he's having a good time. Nearby is Aarhus. Denmark's second largest city with a population of 400,000 is Jutland's capital and cultural hub. Its Viking founders settled here in the late 700s, where the river hits the sea. Today, Aarhus bustles with a lively port, an important university, busy pedestrian boulevard, and an old quarter filled with people living very well. Aarhus uncovered its river, which until just a few years ago had been paved over and busy with cars. Today, this scene is a classic example of how towns all over Europe are respecting both their heritage and their people's needs. The river's lined with trendy eateries, and it's a hit with locals and visitors, both young and old. Another new dimension to the town is its striking modern art gallery, the Aros Museum. The building itself creates a stimulating environment. Galleries are a well-described delight to explore and thought-provoking. This circa 1970 wall of jars contains a slaughtered horse. It's called the Sacrifice. When people were appalled at the needless killing, the artist asked, but what about Vietnam? And you'll meet one very big boy. The Australian artist Ron Muick created this towering, super-realistic figure and called it simply Boy.
For something more traditional, we're visiting the city's Old Town Open Air Folk Museum. With 75 historic buildings carefully moved here from throughout Denmark, it gives a look at Danish urban life in centuries past. On this merchant's mansion, the carved relief dates from 1571. Costumed actors wander the cobbled lanes as if living in the 19th century. This couple's selling everything for a trip to America. Their skillet has to go as eggs in America are just way too big. Well, this is too small. Why? We have heard that they have big eggs in America. <laughs> you can appease your sweet tooth in an old-fashioned way. And here in the bakery, you'll see tasty Danish treats are nothing new. A city bus runs through a forest out to the town's prehistory museum. The museum has three parts, Stone Age, Iron Age, and the Viking Age. The Iron Age ranged from 500 BC to 800 AD. This collection features a trove of iron weapons and jewelry from around 200 AD. As people then believed the gods lived in the bogs, that's where their sacrificial offerings were tossed. After defeating your enemy, logically, you'd toss their weapons to the bog gods. The museum's claim to fame is the Growball Man, the world's best preserved bog corpse. Like the weapons, he was sacrificed and tossed into the bog. Because of the oxygen-free environment, this 2,300-year-old bog man looks like a fellow half his age. Archaeologists think he looked like this in happier times. He sprawls out in his glass tomb as if to welcome visitors old and young to marvel at his skin, nails, hair, and even the slit in his throat he was given back in 300 BC at his sacrificial banquet. Well, I heard Dave from Aarhus, that, a three-hour um, train that there's a new museum where the bog man is being held or where he's being shown. Uh, there is. It's a very new museum for a very old man. Um, this is the <laughs> Mosgård Museum. It's south of Aarhus, probably a half an hour or so. It's not done by Bjarke Ingels, but by an architect called Henning Larsen, who did, did Copenhagen's Opera House. But it's a beautiful building with a sloped roof covered with grass. So you can actually go on the roof of the museum and have a picnic, look out at the forest and the fjord beyond. Just a, a beautiful building. Wow. Wow. I'm sure. Is he one of the main exhibits there that people come to see? Uh, yes, but actually it's quite a large museum of prehistory and ethnography and all that. So uh, you have to kind of ask questions to find out where the bog man is, but he's definitely one of the highlights. Yeah. <laughs> all right, here we go. ...ride through the pastoral countryside dead ends in the town of Svenborg, where our ferry awaits, ready to sail to the Isle of Aero. The ferry loads and departs like clockwork, typical of Danish efficiency and the boat cruises through some delightful island scenery. As we approach the island of Aero, the charming town of Aeroskoping comes into view. This is the best preserved 18th century town anywhere in Denmark. The government, recognizing its value, prohibits any modern building here. Those who visit find themselves dropping right into the 1700s when Aeroskoping was the wealthy home port of a hundred windjammers those mightiest sailing vessels of the pre-industrial age. The many Danes and Germans who come here for the tranquility call this the fairy tale town. Characteristic houses lean on each other like drunk sleeping sailors. Appreciate the finely carved old doors. You won't find any two the same. Hoogly, that quintessential Danish word for cozy, describes aeroscoping well. The harbor's a hive of relaxation. The surviving windjammers are now chartered by vacationers, and the marina now caters to holiday yachts. A big part of the island's tourism is from boaters. Pension Vestergaard, lovingly run by Susanna Grave, is my home away from home in aeroscoping. This salty, sagging, and venerable eight-room place was built in 1748 for a sea captain's daughter. From the elegant sitting room to the creaky attic, the place is filled with character. Susanna's generous breakfast is served in a charming dining room. Bedrooms come with slanted floors and fine views. 
Rick mentioned that this town, uh, Aeroscobing, is he, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, but he said Hoogly, I believe. And this is a term I've kind of seen on social media in the United States. How do you describe this term, Yena, and how do you feel about the U.S. kind of taking it as its own? It's really, it's really interesting. I think it has become very popular with it's something Brits and Americans talk a lot about, that something is hoogly, and you did pronounce it correctly. Uh, it's, it's one of those, it's, it's hard to define what it is, but you, because you cannot really translate it to, to cozy, which is what you would see in a dictionary, I think. But it's, mm -hmm. it's represents a certain sense of contentedness, being happy, being comfortable. It's about how we interpret the world, being in the presence of, you know, good friends, some drinks and things being just so. And, but I will also contend that it's, um, it's a little bit more than just sitting in front of a fire with your knitted socks and, and wool blanket. Uh, but I will contend that it helps to have some live candles lit uh, for something to be hoogly. Yes, I feel like there's a couple months there where everyone was posting pictures of like a scone or something in a coffee and saying <laughs> hashtag, you know, whatever. <laughs> so it's nice exactly. to get the Danish perspective on it too. Well, this pension is still run by Susanna and her daughters, Henrietta and Celia. So you could uh, stay in this pension if you visit Aeroscoping. Aeroscoping is simply a pleasant place to wander, and Susanna's joining me. This is a delightful walk. If I lived here, I think I'd walk here every evening. Yes, I do. I do and love it. And it reminds me how much the island has changed. These houses used to belong to poor fishermen and to poor sailors, and they used to have their boats here that they could drag up to the houses, and now they are very expensive and rather nice houses. But you still have the character. Yes. I love that. And I love the way the roofs all lean. Yeah. And the gardens are just lovingly tended. Yes. Right on the harbor front, the aeroscoping fish house smokes its own catch. Racks of smoked mackerel, salmon, and other fish are sold out daily as locals and tourists clamor for a tasty meal. With a view of the harbor, it's just right for a budget seafood lunch. Well, I have been sipping on my Danish Carlsberg beer throughout the show, and it's really good. Do you have any food to share with us tonight, some Danish specialties? We do. Okay, Dave, if you want to hold it up, then I'll yeah. find out what it is. Got to make sure it doesn't fall onto the... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we have uh, white pickled herring. We have some red onions on top, uh, and it's sprinkled with uh, some chives as well. And it's almost always eaten with an egg and a slice of tomato. And it's it usually serves as the first course in a large uh, Danish Christmas lunch or traditional lunch. Um, and it's also accompanied by um, people scolding or saying cheers because that's part of a big um, event as well. So I would like to just teach everybody if people want to follow along uh, in their own homes about how to say the school or how to say cheers in Danish. So basically it starts like this, school. School. You raise your glass, never higher than your eyebrows. Then you make quick yet meaningful uh, eye contact. You take a sip. And before you put down the glass, again, you raise your glass, quick yet meaningful eye contact, and put down the glass. It's also a wonderful way I always say to people when you're sitting, sometimes stuck at a dinner party uh, or a lunch party in this case, and with people that, you know, people have had a little bit too much to drink and maybe they're talking a li little bit too much. Sometimes I just tell people, if you want to change the subject, just say school. That gives you at least a few minutes to <laughs> rearrange what you want to talk about or turn the other way. How to redirect a conversation politely yeah. in yes. Denmark. Can and you we are drinking uh, Carlsberg beer, the mm -hmm. famous Danish Pilsner. Mm -hmm. And Ian and I were just drinking Akavit, which is a kind of a flavored vodka served ice cold, often flavored with caraway or anise or, or, or dill and served in little small 
glasses like this. And I, I think the aficionado would say you don't have to have it ice cold because that means you can't taste it as much, but most people like it ice cold. Yes. <laughs> and when you scold, does it have to be with Akavit or can it be with any beverage? It can really be with anything. Uh, you can even have a soft drink or, you know, a glass of water and it's perfectly fine. Okay. It's just the way that the Danes say, you know, cheers. Mm -hmm. And I like the meaningful eye contact. I know in Europe, I learned to make eye contact when you cheers with someone, but in the U.S., I think it's not necessarily as common that um, people yeah. do so. so. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And so is skull, is that pronouncing it correctly? Skull. Yeah, it doesn't have a glottal stop after the, um, that A with a circle over it. And here are some unique uh, letters in, in Danish. We have three additional vowels just to outdo most other languages. <laughs> Um, so uh, the first one is A, and that's the that's the letter that is um, in Eru, and Ö um, is also in Eru, um, and uh, Brød, like bread, Brød uh, is how that's pronounced, uh, and then O as in school. Uh, and then probably the hardest one to pronounce though is the Y is it's <laughs> um, but, but I would say in general, people feel uh, people who try to learn Danish, they feel that these letters, it really mean, they really mean you can't pronounce this it's <laughs> impossible. Well, wow. and I then of course the J like uh, Jane or Jena in this case, uh, it's pronounced like a Y. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. The arrow, that sounds totally different than just saying arrow. So that's, it's always interesting to learn the different letters and pronunciations. I think it's really fun. Let's see here. Well, we're continuing on um, to do some bike riding around arrow, which I love in this next scene, seeing Rick bike around. For me, the best way to explore arrow is on two wheels. I'm meeting friend and local guide Jan Peterson for an island bike ride. Bike rental's easy. No deposits, no locks. This is Arrow. I've recommended this leisurely ride for years in my guidebook to show off the best of this island's charms. The island is 22 miles long, has 7,000 residents, seven pastors, no crosswalks, and three policemen. Historically, Arrow has depended on shipping and farming, mostly dairy and wheat. U-shaped farms are typical throughout Denmark. The three sides block the wind while storing cows, hay, and people. Jena, is this similar to your family farm? Is this what it kind of looked like? Uh, it's very similar to my parents' farm, except that I would say that ours is a little bit neater. Uh, <laughs> Um, but yes, it, it looks like this has one, two or three wings, like a U-shaped uh, farm. So yes, very similar. Mm -hmm. And I think, is this a, a painting of your family farm? That is actually a painting of the family farm. So originally it was U-shaped. Uh, you see the thatched roof on the stables, uh, mm -hmm. on those buildings. Uh, and then the new house, which is what you see with the slate roof in the foreground, that's the new house that was turned into living quarters, and that was built in the year 1900. Wow. Do you know who painted this? Just one of the previous owners? No, I, I really don't know. It must have been somebody that my great-grandfather uh, knew, because he was the one that uh, built uh, this new house. Um, and it, this was painted you know, close to when it was completed. Mm -hmm. I love this painting, the simple colors and it just looks like a, a nice place to you can imagine kind of walking through that archway there and the, yeah that's yeah that's and it's still there the archway is still there oh wow do your parents still live here uh they sold it a few years ago mm -hmm. wow well it is beautiful thank you okay. let's continue on the bike ride it's the kind of place where local produce whatever's in season sits on the roadside for sale on the honor system We are now riding below sea level. Right. The sea is above this height and just behind this dike that was built around 150 years ago to keep uh, the sea out to claim this wasteland that so was here. all of this was reclaimed then? Yes, it is. 
and uh, is uh, today used for grazing for cows. Most of Arrow's villages are further inland, not visible from the sea. Church spires were stunted, designed not to be viewable from marauding pirate ships. This church with a whitewashed exterior dates from the 12th century. Its long nave leads to the altar. With gold leaf on carved oak, it's from 1528, just before the Reformation came to Denmark. It's a remarkable church. Yes, it's a special thing is these reversible pews. Uh, you have the service up here, but when the sermon is on, you have to flip over. Okay, so we watch the service, and then when it's time for the over. sermon, yes, you look pay at the attention pulpit. to the pulpit that is in the middle of the church. In the back of the nave, a list of pastors goes back to 1505, all theologically related to Martin Luther. He's painted with his hand on the Bible as if on a theological rudder steering the church on a true course. The current pastor, Janet, is the first woman on the list in over 500 years. Arrow, like Denmark in general, is embracing clean energy home to communally owned, state-subsidized windmills and one of the world's largest solar power plants, it's well on the way to its goal of energy self-sufficiency. This field of solar panels saves 1,500 homes a third on their heating costs. You know, I often hear about Scandinavia and it seems to be kind of ahead of the world when it comes to green energy. Is this something that's really important in Denmark? It's super important for Denmark to be on the forefront um, of renewable energy. And I think part of that is probably because uh, the sea level, uh, any sea level increase impacts people very quickly in Denmark uh, because no points are more than 500 feet high. Uh, but for example, uh, AOE is indeed self-sustainable uh, with energy, with alternative energy or renewable energy at this point. At this point. Um, and uh, aside from solar panels, they have a lot of wind turbines and Denmark exports a lot of wind turbines. Perhaps people have heard about Vestas. Uh, that's one of the largest uh, wind turbine uh, manufacturers in the world. We have lots of them in Washington state, across the U United States from uh, through Texas, California and to the East Coast. Um, AOE was actually awarded um, a top prize by the European Union in 2021 as the most sustainable island in Europe, which is pretty amazing. Wow. There are also a couple of other larger islands, not the two main ones that we've talked about today, but they are far off into the sea and they also use renewable energy uh, to, for everything from, from power um, to everything else. Uh, so it's, it's really fantastic that people are doing that. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it seems like sheep can wander through them. So it's not a problem to and wildlife. A problem. Yeah. <laughs> it seemed a little bit annoyed that somebody was uh, taking photos. Of <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, Rick is still biking. I love seeing them bike around the island in this next scene. A short walk from the road takes us to a fascinating prehistoric site. 6,000 years ago, this was an early Neolithic burial place. Though Arrow once had more than 200 of these prehistoric tombs, only 13 survive. Vikings also appreciated the holiness of this site. This is such an evocative spot. Yeah, imagine a thousand years ago, the Viking chief would gather the community here to bury a person here. They built a ship and burned it. They have found pieces of burned wood in the underground here. So this is it, actually the shape of a Viking ship. This is the shape it? of a Viking ship. A you have Viking the stern ship. up there. Yeah. And uh, even longer ago, they came here to use this as a holy spot. And this stone burial chamber is actually much older. It's 5,000, 6,000 years old. As old as the pharaohs. Yes. The Vikings recognized this as a holy ground and uh, later on put their uh, holy spot here. I think one of my favorite things to see in Europe are these ancient rock sites like Stonehenge or this one here. This one would even be more neat since it's off the beaten path. Are there many of these sites in Denmark? And were you even 
married in a similar circle, I might have heard. We actually <laughs> were married in a stone circle, in a stone circle from uh, the newer Stone Age. Uh, from We are assuming that it's between uh, 3200 BC to 2800 BC, the one we were uh, married in. But this particular stone circle and burial chamber is actually interesting because it's also these places also represent recycling of, you know, something that was holy in the Stone Age, in the Iron Age, in the Viking Age, and even up to our present time, because right next to this stone circle is a church. So it's the idea that something is holy or sacred, and it's recycled throughout the ages, which is interesting, I think. Wow. And is this a picture of another site here? Yes, this is uh, actually called Tinkstilled, and this is where Dave and I were married. It's a stone circle, again, from the Stone Age, from uh, at least 2,800 years before Christ. Um, part of it where the people are standing, uh, part of those stones have fallen into the fjord. Uh, but many people think that these stone circles, they are almost always uh, depicted as a shape of a ship because uh, a vessel is kind of a travel in time, if you will, to take people out to sea, to take people to heaven, if, if that's what you believe in. And uh, they believe that, you know, this particular place, Tinkstil, place of council, is also a place that might have been used to elect a, a, a legend king in Denmark. Whether that's actually true, I don't know, but it's a good story. Uh, mm -hmm. Another thing with Tink, is that it is something that is used in the names of parliaments uh, throughout Scandinavia. In uh, Denmark, the parliament is called a Folketing. In Sweden, it's called a Storting. And even um, in what I would call, at least in Scandinavia, the mother of all parliaments in Iceland, uh, Tingvala, for those people who have been there, uses this word as well, which is an old Nordic uh, concept. Um, so place of council, Tingstead, this also happens to be where Dave and I were married. Mm -hmm. wow. Well, I love the stone circles because they're beautiful spaces, the history, but also kind of the mystery behind them, because I think no matter how many studies we do, I don't know if we'll ever really know why they chose this spot and why it was special to, or what the purpose was. So they're just really neat places to it's go. It's really just nice to, you know, even be bicycling in a, anywhere in Denmark, you see these um, burial chambers like this with the large stones. So you see shapes of hills that are perhaps a little bit too perfect. Uh, they don't, they look like they're man-made. And if they look like they're man-made in Denmark, they probably are. Uh, and it's it would house some sort of a grave chamber with or without the stones. Wow, that's really special. Well, I was wrong the last scene. Rick was walking, but now he will be biking along to the highest point uh, on the island of Arrow. Here we go. So, got a little hill here. A little hill. We're going to the highest point of the island called Sunshoy. What, is, what does that mean? Seems high. How high is it? 6,750 <laughs> centimeters. 6,700 centimeters. That's about 2,700 inches. Yeah, something like that. Jan, we've summited arrow. Seems high. Yeah, but worst of you. Sure is. Just a short stroll from aeroscoping, a narrow spit is lined with cozy beach huts and families savoring a balmy July evening. Denmark embraces the notion that small is beautiful, and here, the concept of sustainability is nothing new. These tiny beach escapes are privately owned on land rented from the town. Each is different, but all are weathered by merry memories of locals enjoying themselves Danish style. To cap our visit, tonight we're joined by the mayor and his friends for a picnic dinner on the beach. A former music teacher, he's leading us in an appropriate song for Arrow. The ship went down, but the sailors survived, making it back to their beloved homes and families. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. With each visit, I'm impressed with the many charms of this low-key yet self-assured land. 
I hope you've enjoyed our look at the best of Denmark. I'm Rick Steves. Until next time, keep on traveling. Well, Dave and Yena, that was so much fun learning about Denmark with both of you. I think there's so much more we could learn. We didn't even cover Copenhagen, but thank you both for being here tonight. Delighted. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And before we get to the questions, we always have our word from our sponsor. And the word from our sponsor tonight is Rick Steves Europe. Um, we do have a Scandinavia tour that goes to Sweden, Denmark, Norway. Um, it touches on quite a few different countries there. And we are having a summer tour sale starting um, tomorrow. It's May 10th through May 31st. And it will be $200 off tours with seats available that start in June, July, and August. So if you're dreaming of going to Europe this summer, that is a great opportunity to save a little bit of money on a dream trip. And now we can get into questions. Gabe has been going through them and sending them to me throughout the show. And let's see, Jena, since you're from Denmark, Jennifer was wondering, what is the best time of year to visit Dan Denmark? The best time of year? Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I, I would say as a Dane, any time of year, but as a tourist, if you're going there once in a lifetime, I would definitely go in the summer. So I would say any time from mid-May or even now is a nice time because you don't have a lot of tourists there um, through the end of August or even into early September. Ooh. Is, do many people travel there in the winter or is it pretty much... Just the summer uh, season. Only people who want to go to Denmark uh, for the holidays, I think. Yes, mm -hmm. that makes sense. It is a very hoogly time to go in the winter. <laughs> that's right. That's yes. <laughs> lots of warm socks. Yeah. Lots of warm socks, lots of wool blankets. Yeah. And Catherine, this is kind of a fun question. Catherine says the Danish Kringle is a popular pastry in Wisconsin. Is this a common pastry in Denmark? Or if it's not, um, what are some of the most popular pastries in Denmark? It is a very popular, it's a very traditional pastry in Denmark. But honestly, uh, if you're going to Denmark, go into a bakery and just um, you know, point at stuff that looks good to you. Yeah. Because going into a Danish bakery is really an experience. And the nice thing about traveling in Denmark is that everybody speaks, well, except my parents, everybody <laughs> speaks Danish or everybody speaks English rather. Yeah. And you can just speak English to the people in the bakery and the shops. And if something looks good to you, you know, just point to it or tell them, oh, can I have a piece of that? And they will be more than happy to give you that mm -hmm. perfect English. Do you have a favorite Danish pastry, both of you? I, um, my favorite Danish pastry, which is something that I often eat for breakfast on weekends, is called a tidjokus. Um, so it has a lot of poppy seeds, black poppy seeds on top. It, it uses, I don't know, perhaps one of those uh, pound of butter or something like that. <laughs> and... Um, I think there's some almond paste in there and then you have it with the cheese or and or butter and or jam and it's really delicious. Yeah, it's not super sweet, something more for a breakfast type thing. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Dave? Do you have a favorite? Danish oh man, um, there are so many. I like, they kind of have a version of a cinnamon roll called a snyla. Mm -hmm. that I, I like those quite a bit, very flaky and gooey and all that. So they're, mm -hmm. they're delicious. Yeah. Does snyla, does that mean snail in English by Very chance? Very good, okay. yes. I, I think I've heard of that one before. I do love pastry, so yeah. <laughs> it's up my alley. Um, let's see, Robin was wondering, um, it's often said that Denmark is the happiest country in the world. Um, I'd be curious to hear from both of you. Do you agree? And why do you think that is? I Yes, well, maybe you can go ahead. Uh, I would first. say when we think of happy, we sort of think of dancing and big smile on our face and all that. I don't know if that's the right word. I would say Denmark has got to be, at least in my experience with Europe, one of the most content countries. Happy, I don't know about that, but as far as contentment and feeling good about their society, you know, the taxes that they pay that give themselves a good life and also mean that you rarely see homeless and people and all that. I think that, that contentment for living in that society, I think Denmark definitely ranks very highly. And I think also the fact that 
even though you are, you can be poor by Danish standards, it's not all middle class, but um, you never will have to be concerned about having health care or dental care or care for your children if you can't afford it. You know, the, the cost of those services is on a sliding scale. So that, for example, if you are a single mother and you need health care and you need childcare for your children, uh, you don't pay very much and maybe it's even free. Maybe your housing is subsidized. Uh, but I can tell you this, living on welfare in Denmark is not very fun. Like living on welfare is not fun in any country. But uh, there is, uh, it is nice. I feel that, you know, you pay to not see uh, people be in dire straits. And, and uh, that is a nice thing I feel as a Dane to pay for that other people are taken care of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I imagine it feel good knowing that everyone is at least okay, you know, it's nothing such extreme. So that is interesting to hear that perspective. Uh, it's sort of that idea that in the States, we tend to judge our society by how well the average person is doing. In Denmark, I think they judge it by how well the lowest person is doing and they want to raise that up. Mm -hmm. wow. <clears throat> wow, yeah, that's, that's great. And speaking of finances a little bit, um, what are some good ways to save money traveling in Denmark, if you have any suggestions, since it's such an expensive place? Let's see. Well, first of all, you know, if you remember back on Eru, um, the woman, Susanna, run by her daughters now that staying in a, a guest house like that or a pension, there's a lot of different names for it. That's going to save you a lot more money than staying in a hotel. So that would be one way. Um, what do you think, Ina? Picnicking is kind of a nice way yeah, to. Yeah, I think, you know, even going to the bakery, get the bread or the whatever pastries or rolls that you want for the day. Go to either the supermarket or a butcher shop, cheese shop uh, for what you want to put on it. And maybe even, you know, head to the place where they sell greens. Uh, it's fun. And you can kind of snack your way through the day. I think that's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the video we saw at the end of the show with Rick on the beach having a picnic. And yeah. Yeah, I think picnics yeah. are great. They're so fun. Yeah, that's very nice. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, David was wondering, this is kind of interesting. What is Denmark's relationship with the EU like? Are Danes generally glad to be part of the European Union? They are glad to be part of the European Union. Uh, at least since 1972, Danes have been part of the European Union. And benefits a lot because if you can imagine Denmark is a very small country if we could only uh, trade with with a few select countries without uh, export barriers that would be a huge problem for us so Denmark's largest export partners are uh, Germany uh, Sweden and uh, Great Britain which is now outside of the EU but uh, you know to be part of that is super important to be able to export Although Denmark has chosen not to use the, the euro, they still use their own currency, the, the, the kroner. And that is in part due to the fact that Denmark wants to be able to set its own social uh, policies, like, you know, what are the subsidies going to be for, um, you know, a mother, single mother with two children and so on. So for example, you may remember that um, a few years ago, um, it was very hard. There was austerity, right? Uh, the EU imposed austerity on uh, Greece uh, because the debts were so high. And in that case, uh, the EU imposed rules on, on uh, retirement age, social benefits, and a lot of other things. And that's because they were part of the euro, uh, so the actual currency. That means that they were part of the monetary collaboration. Um, so Denmark and some other countries, because they don't want anybody else to dictate their social um, policies, they are outside of the common currency. But uh, it's interesting that, for example, countries like Denmark actually have the slightest, they have very little fluctuation of their currencies and they are, you know, much more well managed that, than some of the other countries that um, use the European currency or the euro. 
Wow, that seems like the best of both worlds for them. They get the training benefits, but then they can keep setting their own. It's all about getting the most money from the EU, I think. Yeah. Whichever, yeah. Whichever, whatever you can do to get mm-hmm. the most benefits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think every country views it that way. Yes, yeah, I agree. Well, we have time for just one more question tonight. And I'm just kind of curious, since you both are so connected to the Scandinavia tour, which does go outside of Denmark. What is your favorite stop on the tour? Dave, maybe you can go first and then Yena can finish. Oh boy, I could pick any place in Denmark, but outside of Denmark, I think I would choose Stockholm. It's just a, a beautiful city that really takes full advantage of its setting on the on the water. And I think for me, uh, I think for variety is uh, the trip that's called Norway in a nutshell, starting in Oslo and ending in Bergen, taking the train, experiencing what it's like to travel on public uh, transportation, get off uh, and take the small incline train down to the fjord, get on the ferry, uh, sail through uh, one of the arms, I think it's of the Sogna fjord, isn't it? And then back, uh, catching another train uh, back to Bergen. It's really quite amazing. It's an amazing day trip. Wow. It's amazing you can do all that in one day, too. People often it ask amazing me about it. So. Because of that fantastic Scandinavian infrastructure and public yes. transportation. <laughs> <laughs> well, David Yeager, this has been so much fun learning more about Denmark with you both. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thanks very much. And thank you. Skull. Skull. Skull, everybody. Skull. All right, Skull to everyone at home as well. And thank you again, Dave and Yena. Um, next week, I just wanted to remind you that we are headed outside of Europe to visit New Zealand with our guide, Colin Mears. He's a Scottish, but he's been living in New Zealand, so he's going to show us some of this beautiful country. And then the week after is when Rick will be returning to do his spring trip report. So we're very excited to have him back. And as always, thank you for joining us on Monday Night Travel, and we hope to see you next week. Good night, Yena. Good night, Dave. Good Good night, night, Julianne. Good night, everyone.